Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? I remember growing up, my dad uh, used to tell my brother and I after we got our driver's license and just when we were starting our friends were getting their driver's license. He always told us, be careful who you ride with. And he used to tell us this story, and, I, and it made such an impact on me, I've never forgotten it. He used to tell me this, and I said, now boys, if you're in a car and you're riding with someone and you get pulled over by the cops, that's not good. But if you get pulled over by the cops and there's beer in the car, whether you knew about it or not, whether you were drinking or not, whether you bought it or not, if there's beer in the car, boys, you're guilty. My brother and I would look at him and go, but dad, we didn't have anything to do with that. He'd say, boys, it doesn't matter. You need to be careful who you spend time with. And I've never forgotten that because it's true, isn't it? I know for a fact that guilt by association is true. I've lived it firsthand. And you know, the takeaway is, is that what we do individually affects the whole. What we do individually affects the whole. In fact, this last week I was sitting with my, one of my mentors and he, he was uh, talking about his staff. He, he uh, oversees a large staff at a church and uh, he was talking about how he oversees six different campuses and his six different campuses are led by six different people. And he made the comment to me, he said, you know, those guys are pretty solid guys. Most of those guys are not going to be taken out by some big sin, right? Uh, because these guys are committed. These guys are, uh, they're, they're getting after it. And, and, and so he, he drew this illustration up on the board. And what he said was, and, and I'm not going to draw all of the black boxes up there, but he said, basically, this individual plus this individual plus this individual equals the whole. And here's what he said. All of us have stuff in our journey, right? Because we're all sinners, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that. All of us have stuff in our journey. And so he, he just kind of drew a red line at the top at each of these. And he said, this is what represents that margin in our journeys. Everybody has margin. Everybody has those things in their life that they're working on. Everybody has those things in their life where, and I'm talking to believers this morning, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ today, then your whole box is red, okay? Understand that. I'm talking to those of us this morning that have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. And we have those things that are red in our life. Now, if you, can you just multiply this times 600, which is the average weekly attendance we have at all of our environments here at Summit Heights. And you take that average attendance of 600, and you take all of that red, and when you begin to add all of that up, all of a sudden we see where the whole is affected. Where what we're doing individually affects all of us. And here, here's where I believe, because I, I, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption about all of us in this room, because I, I, I'm going to say that most of you in this room don't have the big sin, right? The big sin is going to take you out, send you to prison, and, and, and we're not going to see you for 30 years, right? At least I hope not. Can't see you back there in the dark. Maybe back there. I don't know. Here's where I think most of us struggle. Our margin comes in our relationships and how we treat others. Jesus said this in John 13, 34. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. 
So you must love one another. And then verse 35 jumps off the page at me. Listen to me. He says this, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. By this, Jesus said, people will look at us, they will look at the individual, but they'll also look at the whole of Summit Heights and they will look at us and they will ask the question, hey, do they love one another or do they talk about each other the same way we talk about our friends? Oh, you see, this can be applied to organizations, to churches, if you run a business or anything, this can be applied to everything because what we do individually, but what we do in relationships affects the whole. That's why Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. While most of us in this room hopefully are not gonna do something that's gonna land us in prison, I think what happens for many of us is relationships are where the enemy gets us and how we deal with one another and how we respond to one another. It's those little areas that add up to the whole or the big picture. This last week, I was reading in Romans chapter 12. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. And, and we're gonna look at a passage uh, that Paul was writing and he's talking about this very thing. In Romans chapter 12, up on the screen, we're gonna read 13 verses. But the very first word in Romans chapter 12 is therefore. Therefore, I urge you, Now I've taught you this before and I wanna teach it to you again. Anytime you find the word therefore in scripture, you have to ask what the word therefore is there for, right? Because therefore is predicated on what was said before. Therefore signifies an action that doesn't just come out of the blue, that, that now the writer is saying therefore based on what he has already said. It's built on something. When you follow a therefore, it's rooted in something. And so when you look at chapter 12 and chapter 13 in Romans, we see that this whole passage here that we're gonna look at a short passage this morning and the next couple of weeks, we're gonna look at some more of this passage. But all of this is predicated on what Paul has already said in chapters one through 11, that Paul here now is moving from doctrine in, 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 in chapters one through 11. And now he's moving on to practice. He's moving on to how we live this out, from theology to ethics, so to speak, from foundation to application, that Christianity lives and grows out of something. And so Paul has already laid a foundation in chapters one through 11, and now he's kind of switching gears, and he's saying basically this, justified sinners live in relationships, right? We all live in relationships, and we should be working hard to make those relationships durable and, multi and mutual beneficial. So where the enemy is going to come at us, I believe, is in this area of relationship. And Romans 12, 1 through 13 says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, by the mercies of God, Paul wraps up all of chapters 1 through 11. It's amazing to me. There's so much theology in chapters 1 through 11. And here's how Paul wraps it up. In view of God's mercies. <laughs> it's a simple summary for so much that was said. He's talked about wrath. He's talked about faith and sovereignty and sanctification and so much more. And then here's what Paul says when he's kind of making this shift. He goes, in view of God's mercies, everything from chapters one to 11, Paul has wrapped up into one word, the mercies of God. God is merciful. I believe it's, the reason is, is because the purpose of God's mission is to glorify God. Everything that we're to do is to glorify God. And that's why we exist, to make people amazed at the mercy of God. That when people look at our life, that they would be amazed at the mercy of God, that God would forgive somebody like you. <laughs> Isn't that good? Maybe it's just good for me, I don't know. <laughs> that people would look at us, that treating others merciful is the best way to make other people see how God's treated us with mercy. See, all of a sudden, Paul moves from theology to practice of saying, look, in view of God's mercy and what he did for you, then the way you treat others should be in view of God's mercy that everybody looks at you and goes, man, God is good. Amen. I mean, Romans 12, verses 8, 9, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, and 20 is just literally dripping with mercy. 
of what God did for us and how we should respond to others, that mercy flows out from us, must be rooted in mercy, that we understand what God's done for us, a lifestyle of mercy is the lifestyle that best displays that God is a merciful God and how we treat others out there and how we treat each other in here. Jesus said, people will know that you're my disciples by the way you love one another. That's how you give mercy to other people. (laughs) Man, that's so good. For us to see that, that God's mercy towards us is the way to live a lifestyle of mercy in view of all that God's done for us and all that God did for us from him, through him, by him, that now we would respond to others in the same way God responded to us. And so all of a sudden we have Romans 12 and we know the first two verses of Romans 12 to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And we usually stop right there, but look at verse three. Therefore I urge you, brother and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, look what Paul says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Isn't that good? (laughs) This is your true Excuse, excuse me, do not think of yourself more highly than you often do, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of you has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. So here's what he's saying. Even though we're individuals, we all belong to one another. Okay, well, let's read on. Verse six, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy according with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's given, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it's just to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then in verse nine, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. So here's what Paul's saying. Love must be sincere. In other words, love can't be full of hypocrisy. I love it when people say, I don't go to church anymore because the the church is full of hypocrites. Well, the whole world's full of hypocrites, isn't it? I mean, come on, you go to work every day, right? You'll go eat with a bunch of hypocrites today. Come on, man. He says, love must be sincere in verse nine. Let love be without hypocrisy. Remember Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. And listen, people will know you belong to me by the way you love one another. Loving without hypocrisy. In a sense, it's almost as if Paul shifted gears in verse nine, but you gotta remember when Paul wrote this letter, he didn't divide it up in verses like we have it today, and he didn't put titles at the top of those. I mean, when I write letters, I don't put a title at the top of a paragraph. I just write in all one flow, right? And so Paul's writing here, and there's not a break in here. In a sense, it looks that way, but verses four through eight, he's talking about the use of our spiritual gifts, and then Paul turns from gifts to focus more on the way that we love each other in the church. Remember in 1 Corinthians 12 through 13, he talked about this. And at the end of chapter 12, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you just might jot this down and read this later today, but he said, earnestly desire the higher gifts. He's talking about spiritual gifts into the Corinthian church. And he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love. I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He's saying this, you can do some pretty incredible things, but if you don't have love, then you're nothing. You're just a noisemaker. Paul moves his spiritual gifts to a more general, more excellent way of love. He did it in 1 Corinthians and he does it here. And it's not a new section. He's referring back to verse two. You remember where he said, where he wanted us to have a transformed mind. Well, the way you have a transformed mind is how you treat one another, he's saying. 
He wants us to see what it looks like when we're not thinking more highly of ourselves. When we ought to be thinking highly of Christ and the measure of faith that he has given us in verse three, that he has given us a measure of faith. And so we shouldn't be thinking highly of ourselves because our faith is not something that we could muster up. It's something God gave us. That he's mustering up in us. <laughs> in fact, I'm not sure Paul felt there should be any Pauls between that list in verses six through eight and the exhortation in verse nine, where he's telling us to honor one another. He was saying in verse eight that, listen, if you're gonna be a contributor, then be generous. If you're in a leader, be zealous. If you're merciful, be cheerful. And now he simply adds, love should not be without hypocrisy. Think about it. Of all the things he could have said about love, he could have said, let your love be great. Let your love be earnest. Let it be joyful. Let it be bold. <laughs> he says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Let it be sincere. Let it be real. You see, verse three says not to think of ourselves too highly, but to think with faith. That is to think with our minds and our hearts, looking away to Christ, of how Christ responded to us. That when we see other people, we're not thinking of ourselves too highly. Well, I've been in church all my life. I got saved when I was three. I've been a deacon, I've been an elder. Now Paul says, look, I want you to think back to Christ. You see, verse three is this incredible statement of wonderful self-forgetfulness. To not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to because it's in the service of Christ. You see, the hypocrite is totally concerned about himself or herself. The hypocrite is always asking, how will I appear? It's the driving question of, hey, I wanna make sure I look good when I go to church, amen? I wanna make sure everybody sees me when I pick up this piece of trash at the office. I want to make sure everybody sees me. Look at these baskets at Walmart. I'm going to take them in. Look at me. You want a basket? <laughs> See, the hypocrites are always thinking of themselves first. How can I create a good impression of me? And Paul's working for a transformed mind that's not conformed to the age of this world where this world says, everybody look at me. He's saying, listen, I don't want you to think more highly of yourselves because don't forget chapters one through 11 of what God did when we were sinners that we were in that awful state of evil that God pulled us out of that and placed us in a righteous position. Oh man, come on. And he's calling us in love. To love be without hypocrisy. You see, hypocrisy tries to make the outside look better than the inside. Hypocrisy always makes the outside look better than the inside. That's where I think many of us, man, we look good down here, but it's this inside stuff that we don't want anybody to see. And that's why we'll come to places like this or we'll go to work and everything's fine. Everything's good. You see, hypocrisy tries to make the outside look good. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, it says, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I've gained nothing. That we can do some remarkable external things in this community. But if it's all about what others see and it's not about what's going on inside, you've gained nothing. You know, the classic statement of this form of hypocrisy is where Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse seven, where he says, you hypocrites. He's talking to the religious people. He's not talking to people outside the church. He's talking to us. Now, if you're not a Christian in this room this morning, I'm so glad you're here. But listen, uh, you might be glad after you hear what I'm about to read. Because he's talking to believers. He's talking about people that go to church every day. And in their day, they went every day. And he says, you hypocrites. You did, well, did Isaiah prophesy to you when he said that this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me? You know, few things got Jesus' dander up more than hypocrites. Few things fired Jesus up more than people in the church who are supposed to know better and know to love each other than people who, who, who said with their lips, but in their heart it was wrong in Matthew 23. He said, woe to you, you scribes and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed uh, and self-indulgence. Woe to you, you hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all the uncleanliness. You see, hypocrisy shows itself when we hide that internal sin. And listen, I, my friend told me this last week as he was sharing with his staff. He had six guys sitting around the table. 
and he knew there were some relational issues. And he said, it was so hard for me not to bring up some of those relational issues of jealousy and some of those relational issues of unforgiveness and competition. He said, instead, all I said was, is just, I just laid this out and, and see, it's tempting for me this morning to go ahead and talk about jealousy and unfor- I guess I am, um, <laughs> unforgiveness. It would be so easy to name those sins, but some of you, I might not name your sins, so you might check the box and go, I'm good. And the reality is we're really good at cleaning up the outside, but just allowing that margin to stay there, allowing that margin to stay in that because hypocrisy is hiding our own flaws and we'll draw attention to others' flaws, won't we? We'll we'll kind of, we'll, we'll draw attention to other people. Well, hey, I'm better than them. And hey, I don't do what they do. And hey, I don't drink as much as they do. And I don't, I don't enjoy that many cigars. And I, I'm not in that much debt because we're always trying to do is inflect on them so you won't see ours. You see, this I think is found most frequently in marriage troubles and in junior high when we're always talking about other people, right? <laughs> See, we judge people every day. In fact, Jesus said this in Luke chapter six, verse 42. He says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck out of your own eye. When you yourself do not see the log that's hanging out of your eye. You hypocrite, there he is again. Man, Jesus was kind of brutal on this, wasn't he? First take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. Oh, you see Paul here in Romans chapter 12 is saying real love doesn't act that way. Real love doesn't think of yourselves greater than the other one. We're dragging this log around. Get the picture. While we're inspecting the speck in our brother's eye. While we're judging the sinner out there when the sinner's already in at judgment, right? So then we'll come in here and then we'll judge each other while we're dragging this big old 120 foot long pine tree. How many of you got that storm last night and you were worried about the pine trees in your yard, amen? And Jesus is going, you're a hypocrite. Let love be without hypocrisy, Paul says. It isn't love if it's it's hypocrisy. In 1 Corinthians 13, six, he says that love rejoices with the truth. It rejoices with the truth. But hypocrisy is all about falsehood and concealment and deceit and cloaking and and misleading and hiding. You see, hypocrisy is the opposite of loving the truth. And so it's the opposite of love. And so Paul says, "Let let love be without hypocrisy. In other words, let love be genuine. And when we look at one another, when we see what God has done, You see, that word therefore is so big at the beginning of chapter 12 because it's predicated on what I'm about to say to you is in light of everything I've already said. And see, Paul had just walked through the whole beginning of the gospel. We hear that word gospel all the time. And if you ask 10 different guys what the gospel is, you'll get 10 different uh, definitions of the gospel. And Paul sums it up in view of God's mercies, because that really is the gospel. It's all mercy, because God did not give us what we deserved. It isn't simply that Christ was a good example of mercy. He was mercy incarnate. He was the perfect picture of mercy. See, mercy implies two things, a compassion to the weak and reprieve to the guilty. And if you've ever been shown mercy, you know exactly how it feels. You know exactly what it looks like. Not only have I received the mercy of God, I've received the mercy of men. I can remember that check that was written to me for $33,000 when I was arrested and I was put on probation. And someone wrote me a check for $33,000 because that was my fine. I know some of you are visiting going, uh, really? When I tell you I'm the chief among sinners, I'm, I am he. Because my story is not pre-Jesus, it's post-Jesus. 
And I can remember when that gift was given to me that set me free from the law. That in one swoop, I wrote a check for $33,000. And I remember handing it to the government. And I was free. You see, when you've received great mercy, you're not afraid to give great mercy. You see, mercy is compassion to the weak. It's reprieve for the guilty. And listen, we humans need both grace and mercy because we are guilty. And we need grace. Miserable. And need mercy and oppression. And you may be here this morning, and that may be exactly where you are. You're miserable. And you need nothing more than grace and mercy. I think that's why Paul said in view of God's mercies, He was referring back to those first 11 chapters in Romans chapter three. Our condition was weak and guilty before Christ. See, you'll never meet anybody that deserves God's favor. No one deserves God's favor. No one's done ever anything and anything by themselves that makes them righteous before God. Apart from Christ, we all sin. Apart from Christ, we're all sinners. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Evil's not merely neglecting and hurting man, but it's neglecting and hurting the glory of God. See, he's convinced some of you that you're, you're, you're too far from mercy. You're too far from grace. The enemy doesn't care about you. All he wants to do is tear down the name of God. And so he'll let you stay in your pride and he'll let you stay in your evil. But Romans 3, 21 to 26 now says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Listen to this. This righteousness is given through the faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. In other words, that's to everyone who will believe you can have righteousness. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. See, Paul's saying this. He said, look, I don't care if you're a Jew, you're a Gentile, you're black, you're white, you're from that group or that tribe. It's for all. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in verse 23. And all are justified freely. Everybody say freely. Freely by the grace to the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. (laughs) Listen, there's three huge words found in that passage and all through chapters one through 11. Three huge words that you've probably heard all your life in church. Propitiation. It's a big word. But the word propitiation says this, to propitiate means to appease wrath. That you and I, the biggest problem we have is not bad people. Our biggest problem is God's wrath. And listen, if you're not saved in this room this morning, there's never been a time in your life where you have surrendered your life to God and understand you are under God's wrath. And you, you don't want to be under God's wrath. If he's any God at all, you may not believe in God. You may be listening this morning and don't believe in God. But listen to me. You don't want to be under a God's wrath and especially Jehovah God. Our biggest problem is not your neighbor, not your wife, not your husband, not your ex, not your children. It is God's wrath. And when you're under God's wrath, there is nothing you can do about it. There is nothing you can appease God. But God puts forward his son as a propitiation, as a curse absorber, as a condemnation absorber. Think about this. God's wrath was on me, but, it, but in Christ, he stepped in and absorbed it on Calvary. He took all of God's wrath that was pointed towards me, that was pointed towards you, and Jesus Christ absorbed it. Right, oh, man. You see, propitiation is so important to understand. It's huge for Christians. There will never be a day from now on until eternity. You need to hear this. When God will have one ounce of wrath towards you. And you need to hear that. Because there are some in the church that believe that even after you're saved, you're still under God's wrath and you can't ever get out from under it. Listen, because of Jesus absorbing that, 
You and I who are in Christ are no longer under the wrath of God. You need to hear this. There's some who have been here that tried to preach that in our midst. It's not true if Jesus is our propitiation because he absorbs God's wrath. And when our faith is in Jesus, we are no longer under the wrath of God. Yes, he'll discipline us totally different than his wrath, but he doesn't have one ounce of wrath towards us as believers, as children of the king. (laughs) Come on. His propitiation absorbed all of God's wrath that you and I deserved. His redemption means that he delivered us at a cost of a price. And the price was his life. And Jesus willingly laid it down for you and I. And yet he justified us. So you go back and you read Romans 1 through 11. It's talking about the propitiation of Christ, the redemption of, his, of, of those who believe, and the justification of those to justify us, declare to, to have fulfilled every required requirement of you and I. That Jesus fulfilled every requirement that you and I needed to be made right with God. That God the judge contemplates you and I the sinner. And that's when you and I, when we've surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, when we come to God, we, we go to Jesus as our substitute. We go to Jesus because he is the one. When he comes to judge, we just go, look at Jesus. He's my redemption. It's not anything I've done. Don't think so high of yourself. Paul says, in view of God's mercy, at the moment of redemption, we're no longer about us. It's all about Jesus. All that he did is counted as mine. Go back and read Romans 4, 5 through 6. Everything that Jesus did is now mine because of the union in Christ of my surrendering to Jesus Christ and him being the Lord of my life, our faith in Christ, he counts us as righteous. This is more than just removing wrath. This is, this is more than just the forgiveness of sins. This is having God considered us to have everything that was required of us fulfilled, yeah. done, I think that's what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. Come on. (laughs) Romans 5, 19 says, by one man's obedience, talking about Jesus, that many are made righteous. Don't think so highly of yourself. Don't think so highly of yourself. Remember, it was by one man. Not my obedience for sure, amen? I've got some red. In some weeks, i got a lot of red. Come on. Come on, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. Because there's some weeks, man, my red goes up. But by the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. And he's just not declaring us righteous, but he's constituting us righteousness. And his son's real lived out righteousness. Jesus lived a perfect life so that you and I could be made right with God. When did God become totally for me? You see, I think that's where the confusion comes in because some of us just want to beat ourselves up because we're cloaking. Because we're trying to cover this. Our marriage is bad. Our finances are bad. Our decisions are bad. Our addictions are bad. All these things that we hold on to. And so the only way we know how to do it is to bring shame on ourselves. And if we bring enough shame on ourselves, then we can start putting shame on others. So when did God become for us? At what point? And you might answer that, well, long time ago because he chose us. Well, the problem with that is Ephesians 2 says we're children of wrath. We're born into sin. That we were born into it. You see, God became totally for you when you believed in Jesus Christ by his grace. At that moment, when you received that propitiation, when you received that redemption, when you received that justification, God became for you. The scripture says he demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But at some point, we have to surrender our life to him. And at the moment of that, all the power in the universe is for us, not against us. All the power, man. You see, God is for us. He's for us. That's what makes this passage in Romans so powerful. 
That's what makes this so achievable, that we can actually deal with this red. You see, I believe when Jesus said, love one another, and this is how people will know that you're my disciples. He wanted to make a point that people are watching you. They may have saw you pull in this morning. They watched some folks pull in at Hollybrook. They watched some folks pull in down at the Lutheran church. They're watching people pull in right over here at the Catholic church. And they're watching people pull in at the chapel. And they're watching people pull in at First Baptist and the Methodist church in Whispering Pines, Nazarene. And they're watching to see how we treat one another. In view of God's mercies, don't think so high of yourself. You really think you're that important? I do. There are days where I think I'm the most important guy on the earth. Anybody else with me? Come on. Don't sit there all self-righteous. I'm just telling you, there's some days where I struggle with this. Especially being the leader of an organization. I can walk into a room and I can change the whole room. With those nine people that sit around the table, your staff... I can walk in, and if I think I'm somebody, I can destroy the whole room. And so can you. And when we take each one of our little margins and we add it up, and all of a sudden we look at Summit Heights and we ask the question, what do people see? They're seeing the whole. They're seeing the whole. In view of God's mercies, Paul says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to but by the measure of faith that God's given you. Love one another. That's what makes this passage so powerful in chapter 12. Because in light of our terrible condition, in light of being apart from Christ, we are nothing but sinners and all we do is sin and we can't do anything but sin. You can be good for a little while, I know. But by Jesus and his obedience, we were made right. And in that moment, there's not one piece of wrath coming at us any longer because he absorbed all of that. He absorbed all of that for you and for me. And that's why our surrendering to him in view of God's great mercies, that we can now give mercy to one another. We can give mercy to our spouses to our children, our coworkers. You know, last week we sang a song by Crystal Yates called I Got Saved. And I was listening to that in my office this morning just over and over again. And I want you to listen to these words. It says this, there is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. This sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All my guilt was erased. The chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved, oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. Jesus, how could I want more? The love of God gave me his pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. Oh, I'll never be the same. The love of God pulls me up higher. His will is stronger, and that's why I got saved. Oh, come on. In view of God's mercy, why can't we look at others? See, see, listen, listen. We all have it, don't we? Everybody say yes. Yes. Thanks, Nancy. (laughs) We all have it, don't we? And and you see, I think my fear is, is that for many of us that sit in this room, it's not the big sin. Maybe you've got some addictions you need to deal with, but I, I think where a lot of us struggle is maybe sitting beside you. It may be that wayward child. It may be that boss that you're just unwilling to forgive. That you're just unwilling to show mercy. And and just maybe, in view of God's mercies, 
Because if Edward has unforgiveness, and Danielle has unforgiveness, and Jake has unforgiveness, what does that do to the whole? I'll tell you what it does. Is the world looks at us and see how we treat each other and goes, man, I got enough of that. I don't need any more of that. So Paul just comes after all this theology in Romans 1 through 11. And he says, look, therefore, everything I've said, now listen to me. Let your behavior, let your actions, let your life, don't think of yourself too highly. You were in a wretched state, man. Some of you are there this morning. You need Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Don't think of yourself too highly. You're only there because God gave you faith. Right. He butted into your life and woke you up and realized you needed a Savior. Right. So don't think of yourself too highly. Let's go back and let's deal maybe yes. with some of this. Yes. And just maybe, just maybe. I, I know there's some days I'm, I'm about right here, okay? I get it. And I have to do a lot of cleaning up. I have to do a lot of confession. I, I had a day a couple of weeks ago, I had to write my daughter a text because I had a lot of red that morning. And I couldn't call her during school, so I did the next best thing because I didn't want her to go the whole day. And I think that her daddy was a jerk because I was. And so I had to confess to her that I was a jerk. And I asked her to forgive me and I reminded her who she was in Christ. Yes, that the most important name she has is daughter. Not my daughter, but his daughter. Yes, you see, it's on those days where we are able to confess and realize there's discipline. There's not wrath. There's discipline. That my actions reflect the whole. So I want to leave you with this this morning. Who do you need to prefer? By forgiving. Who do you need to honor by thinking less of yourself? And just maybe, just maybe, this week will look a little bit different. Maybe, maybe the drive home. <laughs> maybe the drive home. Maybe if you're watching this on Facebook or on eText, maybe tonight's dinner will look a little different. But just maybe, just maybe. God wants you to think a little less of yourself yes. and by the faith that's been given to us that we would show mercy to others the way we've been shown mercy. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. So, Father, I love you. I thank you today that we can be practical, that we can be real. God, I thank you that um, you just don't want us to be a bunch of people that have a bunch of knowledge. So somewhere along the journey, we confuse discipleship with knowledge. Somewhere along the journey, we confuse with knowing a whole lot about you, with being righteous. And yet, God, the only thing that makes us righteous is Jesus. Realizing that we're a sinner. Realizing that our sanctification comes from you. And by our obedience, walking with you. And so, God, I pray today. I pray today, God, if there's somebody here this morning, they have never surrendered their life to you. God, there's shame, there's guilt. They feel it right now. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father. You would quicken their heart. You would butt into their journey. And they would hear one message. I love you. I love you. I want to forgive you. And God, I pray if there's somebody here this morning, a man or a woman, even right where they sit, they would hear those words from you. I love you. And I know all your crap. I know all your stuff. And if you'll surrender to me, I'll forgive all that. I'll absorb that, and I'll set you right. Oh, Father, please, this morning, grab that heart. Cast out that shame. Cast out that guilt. Because of Calvary, because of your resurrection, we can stand right when we surrender to you. So, God, I pray if there's somebody here this morning that does not know you, that even right now where they're sitting, that, God, they would surrender their life to you. And, God, I pray for those of us in this room that's been believers maybe for two weeks or 100 years. Would you give us courage, Lord, to look at the margins? To look at the margins. God, we know so much, but yet we still hold grudges. We still puff ourselves up. 
We still want people to look at us. We just want to make it all about us, the, the ultimate hypocrisy. And Lord, I pray today for humility and courage to maybe go to someone. And maybe you've brought that name up to us or maybe to sit down in a journal for that one that passed away years ago and just write that out to give us the courage, Father, to walk through that so that when the world looks at us, Lord, and the way that we love each other and the way we give mercy to each other, that they would look at us and see you. They'd look at us and see you. They'd look at me and see you. That the way I stand in line at Brookshire's is the same of how I'm standing up right here. That there's no difference. I'm a sinner, saved by grace because of you, Jesus. And I thank you for that sacrifice and I thank you for that love. So in view of that, Father, I wanna love others. May that be our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Listen, before you go, we have a place called Grace Place right over here. If you have questions about Jesus or your relationship with Jesus, we'd love for you to go and visit with them. They'd love to encourage you. Maybe you just need prayer this morning. Maybe you just need someone to lay hands on you and pray with you. Or maybe you just need a hug. Amen? Sometimes that's just... That's just it. Good? Okay, so don't, don't miss that. Take a few minutes. Go by and visit. They'd love to do that. I love you. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.